would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker, licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. Welcome to a brand new week, folks. I hope you've had a fantastic weekend. Last week was a tough one. I hope you enjoyed uh, the interview that I put on, uh, that I shared with everyone on Friday uh, from with Tom Caffarella. Uh, I think that was a great show, um, and, and I'm, we're going to be getting more stuff like that. We've we've just talked with Tom, who's from Boston. I think he gives some interesting insights there. We talked about a lot of interesting things. We're going to have another interview this week, uh, this time from an investor in Tennessee. Uh, she focuses her business in Knoxville. But she is a interesting other side of the coin, I guess you'd say. I tend to be more of a stat guy, a process guy, and she has got the warm, fuzzy side of the business pinned down. And she'll be sharing with us her thoughts on that during her interview, which I think we'll be putting out on Friday this week. So make sure to tune in for that. Uh, Also, apologies that we didn't get more show last week. I I had uh, at some point decided I was going to go ahead and take the third and fourth off and just didn't feel very well. Uh, the remainder of the week, I'm still not feeling well. Um, I, I'm feeling much better. Uh, and thanks for to those of you who emailed me to find out what was up. Um, no, the show's still going on. It was just a, a bad week. Uh, I should have uh, I should have really come up with a better plan to fill in those days once I wasn't feeling well. But it kind of snuck up on me. Uh, so today we've got some interesting things to chat about. We're gonna we're gonna do a little bit of an update relating to things mortgage related. I know we've done quite a few shows on what's going on, but July is a big month for mortgages. Some new policies are going into effect that we've brought up in previous shows, bound to continue to contribute to our cons- excuse me our concerns relating to what's happening with mortgages. But we're also going to talk about locations that would be ideal for you to consider purchasing that first vacation property. Now, as most of you may know by now, if you've been listening for a while, I have a vacation income property that I have in Hawaii uh, that fits sort of my criteria for what you should get out of a vacation property. Um, And we'll discuss the top five areas right now in terms of desirability, but also blending in affordability. So we're not going to talk about areas where you have to come up with a million bucks in order to get in on a robust vacation rental. Uh, So we'll talk about that in the second half of the show. But before we jump into that, let's hit some of the big things that are happening in lending for uh, July. These are these are starting to go into effect right now. So so the, we'll start to see the impact of this. And all this is going to do, let, let's set the stage a little bit. Here's what we're worried about. We are worried about a lending set of policies that serve only to increase the number of buyers. And we always need to remember that whenever Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the, the policymakers or different institutions talk about increasing accessibility to funds or broadening the base of borrowers or appealing to broader, a larger number of buyers. Every single one of those phrases refers to subprime lending. Subprime lending is when you are loaning money to folks who are less qualified to handle the burden of the debt by definition, right? Because if someone meets that bar of being qualified, that's it. So the only time you'd ever expand the footprint of lending or increase the availability of lending, every time you use those quaint little sterilized terms, what you're really saying is, we are going to lend more more money to more people who are less qualified than previously. Whatever those standards are, and you may disagree with me, you may say, well, standards were too high already, so we should be doing that. That's fine. We can look to plenty of history that shows that's not true, that when you do this, you create a pool of borrowers who 
end up being a huge chunk of a problem when things go wonky in a market. Uh, and, you know, I would focus far more energy on uh, helping folks develop this because this isn't a question of dumb people versus smart people. I know plenty of dumb people who are qualified to borrow an awful lot of money. It's it's a learned skill like anything else, like learning to drive or, or any other skill. It's simply learning how to manage your money. And then that that education and the imp, the the practice of it is reflected in your credit score and how you take care of your 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 bills from a month to month basis. It's, it's really that simple. People like to complicate it and make it a much more emotional issue. Uh, but the, the reality is, is if you, if instead of simply giving money to folks and instead making the process of them learning how to be great at handling their own finances, we wouldn't have an issue. Uh, and there's a whole other tangent we could go on there, but I'm going to resist that shiny thing in the weeds and try to stay focused. Uh, And we've talked about a lot of different things that have contributed to this problem, but there are several things that kind of kick into gear right now that are big elements that I think are worth mentioning. Now, the first one is uh, the nation's three major credit rating agencies, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, are going to drop huge, huge credit bombs. Uh, And by credit bombs, I mean not ruin people's credits, but artificially inflate people's credits with a new policy that's going to be put into effect in July. Uh, Tax liens and civil judgments from some consumers' profiles uh, will be dropped if the information isn't complete. Now, there's also going to be uh, a a complete abandonment. No one's researching this. This is what drives me nuts. Nobody's going back and simply saying, all right, we need to simply verify these debts better. They're simply saying, we're just not, we're just going to throw them all out. So if you have medical judgments against you, which I'm sure falls under this civil civil judgment setting, that's just not going to play any part in your credit history anymore. It's just going to disappear. Um, And while some of you may be out there saying, hey, you know what? That makes a ton of sense for me. I had a very wrongful element on my credit history that represented a medical problem. I'm in that boat. I had a issue. I had a surgery just before I moved out of the country where literally $1 or $1.80 or something like that was owed to the anesthetist for my surgery. And that stuff just didn't find its way to me in the country that I had moved to. Uh, when it did, I ultimately paid it, but that $1.80 payment that was left was never logged. So I had to go back and jump through, th- through some hoops to get that taken care of, but I did. Um, it never stopped me, maybe because it was such a small amount, but the, the $1.80 went into judgment and I had to point the folks who were assigned the judgment collection, hey, here's the canceled check, here's, here's the whole nine yards, and it was all taken care of. So I get how weird things happen relating to those kinds of debt. However, that is not the majority of this kind of debt. Any most folks who have je- civil judgments against them or some of or anything medical related um, shouldn't just simply have these things dismissed. Uh, should there be a review process to determine whether or not they're valid? Sure, but that's not the direction they're going. They're going the direction of simply wiping them out. And I, if I'm not mistaken, the number that got thrown around of people who would suddenly become qualified to borrow was something near 20 million people. Uh, and that's a whole lot of people. Next on the list, mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are allowing borrowers to have higher levels of debt and still qualify for a home loan. So the debt to income ratio, this is something we covered previously. It's going into effect now. You're, you can now have 50% debt to income ratio, and you're going to qualify for these loans. Now, remember the kind of loans we're talking about here. We're not talking about high down payment loans. We're talking about Fannie and Freddie. We're talking about loans that are likely to be lower down payment loans. And that should be a concern for anyone who wants to have a more robust, strong foundation for lending. Next, uh, the changes are coming when lenders are competing for a shrieking, shrinking market of borrowers. And I think that's an interesting comment. I'll post the link to this article relating to this. But I think that's an important takeaway. Lenders are competing for shrinking market of borrowers. Fewer people are borrowing. Now, we've talked about this before, and fewer borrowers means fewer buyers or at least fewer folks who are able to find a home to buy. And we've talked about how inventory has played into that. And by simply broadening the number of people who can now qualify for a loan. Remember, 
when you say shrinking market of borrowers, you're not saying shrinking number of buyers. You're, you're just saying the number of people who can borrow. Well, you don't become a borrower until you buy a house, right? <laughs> That's just logical. So what we're seeing here is an artificial increase in the demand of properties where there's already not enough of a supply. So the end result will be, and we've had some pretty rational responses up until now on the part of borrowers in terms of saying, you know what, this market is now so on fire in terms of crazy high prices, we're not going to buy here. We even saw it in markets like San Francisco. We, we saw what looked like it was indicating that in New York. So we saw people reach a point where they said, no, I'm not going to play this game. And they went into other markets that were less expensive, but close enough that they could commute to those areas that they needed to go to. So what happens when an industry like banking, now remember when banking got in trouble last time, the government came to its rescue in the ter in terms of bailouts to the tune of billions, if not trillions of dollars. So now banks make money by lending money. It's what they do, right? Uh, and all that money has been printed up. Banks have been holding onto it and are still holding an awful lot of that money, but they aren't able to loan more because there just aren't enough homes for people to buy. The solution to this banks need to underwrite more money or banks need to loan more money. The solution to this problem is not broaden the number of buyers you can loan money to. It's encourage builders to build and the buyers who are out there will be able to buy. What this will do is simply create more pressure for the prices of available inventory to go up. And that is a bad thing. That's what happened last time. We had the frenzy. And remember, if you listened to the show I did last week or the week before, uh, we are now seeing the craziness start again. We're seeing the blood in the water response to the market, meaning folks are making offers sight unseen up to the tune of nearly 30%. We're seeing um, folks making crazy over-the-top offers in terms of going way above asking price. And those are all things that are going to continue to fuel this. And now that we're seeing more, less qualified people as buyers, they're going to make less rational decisions on purchasing and max out what they're borrowing. It's it's the same formula as last time, achieved slightly differently, but the end result is the same, and everyone, I think, should be worried about that stuff. Now, let's talk some real numbers here. Uh, of about 220 million Americans with a credit profile, approximately 7% have liens or civil judgments against them. Now, if you do the math on that, that comes out to almost 16 million people. Um, and with this, these elements of their credit removed, their scores could go up by as much as 20 points. And that's according to a study uh, by credit rating firm Fair Isaac Corporation, or FICO. Quote, it's significant impact for, a st for still a very large number of people, according to Thomas Brown, who's the Senior Vice President of Financial Services at LexisNexis. If you look at someone that has a tax lien or civil judgment, they can be anywhere from two or more than five times more risky just because of the presence of that information. That's very, very significant. Now, what's important is more risky. And they're not less risky for the, in the cases where those folks, that those judgments weren't correct. Um, they, they are risky when those judgments are correct. Um, and they complain about how some credit reports can have mistakes on them, and there absolutely should be a much more streamlined way to deal with those errors, but simply discarding all of them shouldn't be the problem. Um, now, and one other thing you're going to hear from folks out there in the world, um, is things like this, which is included in this article during the last housing boom, anyone with a pulse could get a mortgage, but after the financial crisis, underwriting rules tightened significantly. Yes, but you need to remember that the, the unusual thing was the anyone with a pulse getting a mortgage part that all kicked in, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And the, the crazy freewheeling loans is part of what contributed to the problem. The rules that got put back into effect after the crisis were far more in line with the more rational lending that was prior to the crazy uptick in real estate prices. So what this guy is basically saying is, well, things have been so tight recently, we can go ahead and loosen back up. When in reality, what he's saying is the current method of lending is more like what got us less crazy times, and we should now return to the stuff that contributed to crazy times. So it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, I, I'm, and particularly since the, the, if we had tons and tons of homes, let's pretend we had the opposite problem. 
let's pretend we had tons of inventory. Let's say we had 18 months of inventory. Um, and we had that at one point. And during the, the peak of the downturn, we had that those kinds of numbers. We had, you know, eight to 16 months worth of inventory in some marketplaces. Uh, and and everything kind of kicked back into gear and turned that around. But lending wasn't really the primary problem. It was the number of buyers. The ability to get a loan in my marketplace, and, and this may be different in other areas, but I was never in a place where my buyers were not qualifying for loans. Now, they may have qualified for lower amounts maybe than other times. The, 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 the uh, limits on how much debt you could incur were more stringent. But the idea that those were out of line, I don't think really held water. And the idea that we're now able able to go to 50% debt to loan ratio is insane. Um, I, I'm still not sure how they how they just kind of explain that one to themselves. But these are all things we're dealing with now. So it's important, I think, to be aware of these. This is going to, I think, cause a potentially big artificial jump in the number of buyers that are out there. Um but again, it will also feed the problem, not the solution. And another side note that I think is interesting for this, United Wholesale CEO is saying that the Freddie Mac now skips appraisers for some refinances, um, which, I, which again, it's another tactic to simply increase activity or to increase the number of refinances that actually go through. What, what's amazing about this is all of these steps are things that seem clearly designed to artificially prop up the the banking industry. Uh, If there aren't enough people out there borrowing or people aren't able to borrow because of a lack of inventory, you shouldn't step in and change the rules and make it easier to borrow. You should get more out of the way and and let that market kind of match itself out. Maybe some of these banks need to change their emphasis from loaning money to folks who are buying and maybe need to think about financing building of inventory, right? They're banks. Uh, they can decide where this money gets loaned. And it seems to me the better money for them would be spent on the side of building homes rather than financing the purchase of them. Uh, maybe the risk levels aren't there for them. I don't know. But we'll also I'll include a, a link to the article on this story relating to uh, Freddie skipping appraisers for some refinances. Uh, I, that's another tactic obviously designed to, to sort of bolster the banking industry, but not good for us. In terms of long-term smart lending, not a really good way to go. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we will talk about the five best cities to buy a vacation property. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, the Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com. Robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408 852 0525, California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984 909. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to be covering some interesting data relating to great places to purchase a vacation home. And let's talk about vacation homes a little bit. This is one I've got some current experience with. Uh, I have been doing really well with my vacation property in Hawaii. Um, there's always, since I'm distance, I'm not there. I can't manage it myself. Uh, I've had to deal with rules and regulations and relating to Hawaii. So dealing with property managers, those types of things. And, and that's been an interesting challenge. Uh, simply because mine tends to be in a little bit more of a rural part of the island of Oahu. Uh, So, you know, we can have a show where we just talk about that. But understanding those challenges when you get into this, I think, is important. Uh, I think that a that even more so than with a month to month rental or a long term rental, that owners of vacation rentals really need to get into the driver's seat more 
than in other cases, and we'll we'll explain why. Uh, and another thing is also to be constantly in a in a state of reviewing the market for yourself. So let me give you some insights as it relates to my ownership. Right now, as I said, I have a place in Hawaii, and uh, I have been keeping up on the news and prices and market reports for the island of Oahu, where my property is. And recently, I noticed that the median price of a single-family home on Oahu hit a record high. Now, my home is not a single-family residential home, but usually, you'll see other real estate on that on the island being brought up by those types of numbers as well. So that would be the kind of news that would have me thinking, what should I be thinking in terms of, of selling my property? Should I be marketing it? So for me, what I have done is I've put my property up on Zillow listed as make me make me move. Uh, so it's in there. It's at a price that's about, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's at a very good, that would be a great price for me in terms of pulling the money out of it, um, which would make me definitely turn my head in terms of just how much profit I'd make off of that sale. Um, so something for you to think of if you have a vacation property. But let's get into the details here of of why I think vacation rentals can potentially be a great way for you to go, but also something that requires more of your attention. So let's start there. As I mentioned, property managers tend to be an important part of this. Now, there are varieties of ways for you to manage an investment property or a vacation property that's an investment without having a property manager. Technology can absolutely work for you. And a great example is... If you have um, smart locks on the property where you can, using your phone, create a temporary code that will last for a certain amount of time for someone to access the property. Um, And I know investors who, who this is how they manage their vacation properties. If there's no security gate that you have to go through to get to the property uh, and people can literally walk right up to the front door. They can literally call you on the phone and say, we have arrived, and you can give them your little welcome to the property speech, and you can say, use the code 8877 to enter the home, and you hit enter on your phone, and suddenly, they're able to go inside the property. Um, The best thing is, is you can change that code every time. You never have to worry about keys. You never have to worry about codes because you can can cancel the code or set the code to expire when these folks are, are set to check out. And of course, you can have a separate code for your um, cleanup folks, or if you have a broker or a property manager, you can have a separate code for that person. So you do have options. You don't absolutely have to use a property manager unless the state or county that you're in requires that you have a property manager for these kinds of properties, or if your property is inside of a secured area. So for instance, my property has both of those problems. Hawaii has some very lame laws relating to how your property should be managed, and there's a security gate. So in other words, someone needs to hand them a set of keys with a security fob on it before they can even get into the elevator to go up and go to the unit. So in my case, I have to do that. So that introduces a new level of trouble, right? Property managers are, without doubt, the single most important decision, uh, if you're really truly delegating everything to them, the single most important decision you're going to make relating to your investment property. And I think my experience with my property really demonstrates this because, as I mentioned, I'm in a rural area, so my options in terms of property managers is actually pretty limited. Now, I have a property manager in Hawaii who does not handle everything relating to the property, and I I want to explain why I am far more involved. There are inherent conflicts with property managers, particularly as it relates to vacation properties. If you go to a vacation property manager and you want to try to evaluate whether or not you want them to be your property manager, you need to know some things up front. You should be aware of what other properties do they manage and do they manage any properties that uh, they own. Why? Because you will represent competition for their other properties. Now, if you are going to be renting your property at a rate per day or per week or however you're renting it, that is going to be lower than the other properties that he represents or she represents, 
they will likely rent your property last. Why? Because they're making a percentage on the rental rate. So if someone simply comes to them, we want a place to rent without a specific home in mind, they're going to place them in their the, the property they have that is available with the highest day-to-day rent. Second, if they own a property in the same development particularly, they will rent their unit before they rent your unit, hands down. Now, if you go and check how these folks do business, most of them have their own little website and they simply request a unit of a certain size. They usually aren't requesting a specific unit. So you're always going to get hosed. And what's interesting is I can back this up with some pretty solid data. The person who currently manages my property is the same person who managed uh, the exact same unit for my parents back in the 90s. Now, my family's been involved in this particular development since the 80s. Uh, we've at one point or another, I think they were, there were five different units that were owned by members of my family in this development because they lived there, right? They weren't doing it as an investment. It was just where they lived. During the 90s, my parents didn't live in this unit and they had this same person rented as a vacation rental. It never rented. It rented once every month or two and they never really made any money and they tended to have more problems than they did, than it was worth. So they stopped doing that and they kept it just as a rental for the family or as a a vacation spot for the family. So I purchased it from the other two folks in the family who had an interest in the property and I started the process of deciding how I was going to market it. Well, after knowing theirs and they were, everyone was telling me, don't try to do it as a vacation rental. It just won't work. It doesn't rent. So I decided I would own the process of getting the unit rented. There's a variety of reasons why I did that. Um, I, first of all, knew I could do it better. And I also knew that because of the way things work today, I could do it with relative ease and it wouldn't be that big of a pain in the butt to own that part of the process, which meant a great thing for me. It meant I could go to a property management firm and say, I'm going to own getting the renters. I'm going to own the calendar. I'm going to own collecting the money. I'm just going to pay you your chunk of the pie. And all I want you to do is to be the emergency contact. If anything goes wrong with the unit, I want you to deal with making sure tradesmen can get in there and fix it. And I want you to greet guests and uh, give them the keys and give them the tour and also take the keys from them and do a quick visual verification that the place hasn't been trashed after they leave. That's it. Now, in my case, there were just very few that were in the area and I was able to negotiate a very good rate compared to what the normal rate is. Now, in Hawaii, the normal rate is 30 to 35% of the income of the unit that a property manager will take for a vacation rental, which is unconscionable to me. There was no way I was going to pay that. So I'm paying quite a bit less than that. But then again, they're not really doing much. All I have to do is show up once or twice a week to take care of guests. And that's really it. The interesting comparison now is once I owned the process myself, My unit is rented out three months ahead of time, pretty much week to week, and it's doing exceptionally well. Um, And when you compare that to what it did when this same individual was the only one responsible for getting it rented not that long ago, it made almost nothing. So I think that you need to take that kind of stuff into account. Um, And now I find, because we all tend to use the same people who clean units, I've had two different folks I've used to clean my unit when uh, it's when folks move out, when folks leave, when their stay is done. Both of them have commented that my unit rents more than almost all the others. <clears throat> no one has a higher vested interest in getting your unit rented than you do. Now, how do I do that? Well, am I really breaking my back? No. And in fact, let me save you a lot of trouble. Don't go out, and this is what I did. I did two things. I I did a two-pronged attack. I created a website specifically for the property, robertsrentals.us, and created an entry for it, gave it a great description, included tons of photos, a map to show you where it is, all those wonderful things. And I created an account so that I could collect Visa uh, stuff to, to do the reservations because one cool thing is one thing that I think is key to being successful is making sure that folks can easily reserve and pay for their time online and do it immediately. 
So I provided that ability on my website, and then I also went to VRBO.com and entered it there and made sure to include the feature where VRBO would collect the money. Now, granted, VRBO takes a little piece of the pie, and they charge guests an amount, but the access you get to renters is ridiculous. And within a week of me putting it on VRBO, I had two or three guests already scheduled for the upcoming 30 days. Over the course of the next year, I had zero folks reserve time via my website, and everybody, 100% of my reservations came from VRBO. So my suggestion would be, unless you've got multiple, multiple properties, don't bother with your own website. If you feel like having one to provide deeper information than VRBO provides, fine, but then link it to VRBO, which is what I did. So the calendar you see on my website for the home is all just linked right to the VRBO stuff, and it is ridiculously simple. Uh, really very little complications. It only takes maybe, if I average it out over the course of the week to, to a day-by-day cost of time, we're probably talking five minutes a day that I need to spend worrying about things. And I just send the schedule to the property management person. I send the schedule to my cleanup crew, and that's it. And then I write each of them a check at the end of each month for whatever happened during that previous month. So that would be my suggested way to manage it. Own as much of the process as you possibly can, particularly the getting guests into the unit and collecting the money part. Um, and be able to, and use that as a way to negotiate a much better rate with whatever firm you're using, if you're using a property manager at all. If not, if you are not legally required to use a property manager, in other words, you can own the entire process even though you're not resident. In Hawaii, if I lived there, I could do it, but I don't, so I can't. If you don't face those kinds of rules where you are, then you could actually have your cleanup person serve the same role as you'd normally give to the property manager and just have them own the process of giving them the keys or whatever else. Or you can adopt the high-tech method and not have to do that at all and grant folks access to it, uh, to the property electronically. And I have uh, folks who have vacation properties who have the whole uh, uh, smart locks on the house, and they have cameras outside of the property. They don't have any cameras that are inside the property, but they have cameras that face the front door, all of them wired up and on the internet. So they know when people come, they know when people go, they know when the code gets used to open the door and it's entirely secure. And at any time of the day or night on their cell phone, they can get live streaming video of what's going on around their property. And it gives them a lot of peace of mind. So keep that in mind as you're considering this. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in and cover this list. And what's interesting about this list is the fact that you're, these are these are areas that I don't think we've really talked about much. There's a state that pops up on this list that we've talked about a lot at the number one position. Uh, and I tell you, the more I hear about different communities here, the more I'm thinking about visiting. So let's go ahead and jump in with number five. Well, before we do, let's talk about how they picked this. Um, The study considers the best combinations of good air quality, comfortable summertime temperatures, low crime, and appreciating home values, but with still reasonably priced homes. Uh, The top 10 summer vacation home bargain markets were located in four states uh, with a median home value below $275,000. And here's the final element that is important for you if you're thinking of investing. They're the top five markets for vacation rentals and their summer vacation home market index rating. So in other words... These are places not only where you could find yourself a reasonably priced vacation home to purchase that you could use for yourself when you want. Now, I love to try to get to my Hawaii property as much as I can, but it tends to only be once a year, which is a bummer because I'd much prefer two times a year. Um, But then these also represent numbers that support the idea that you should be able to rent it pretty regularly when you're not in it and generate some positive cash flow. So number five, Weaverville, North Carolina. With a score of 53.43, the average summer month's temperature is 74.2, and the year-to-date 2017 median home price is $265,000. Now, that is the top price. Um, In other words, $265,000 is the most expensive of the top five, so it's all downhill from there in terms of potential barriers to entry from a cost standpoint. Next Number four, Asheville, North Carolina, with a score of 53.75. The average summer month's temperature, 74.2, with a year-to-date 2017 median home price of $259,500. Next on the list, number three, Port Charlotte, Florida, 54.24 score on this particular list. Average summer month's temperature, 83.7 
with a year-to-date 2017 median home price of $150,500. Number two, Waynesville, North Carolina. So North Carolina has dominated this list. Three of the top five are in North Carolina so far. Now, Waynesville, North Carolina has a score of 55.96. Average summer month temperature is 74.2. Year-to-date 2017 median home price for Waynesville, $195,000. Now, this is the number one community. I find it interesting because we've talked about cities in this state before. Crossville, Tennessee, with a score of 58.06. Average summer month temperature, 75. Year-to-date, 2017 median home price, $87,500. Now think about Tennessee for a second. We've also talked about other cities that have popped up on the list. We're going to be talking to an investor from Knoxville on Friday about the great progress she has made in really building her real estate empire in a ridiculously short period of time. We've talked about Memphis, Tennessee, that has got great numbers in terms of things that would attract investors. We also saw it doing great in terms of the uh, year o- over year. If you had purchased a property a year ago and you were looking at cash flow over that entire year, it was in the top 10 the last time we checked those numbers. So Tennessee's got something going on. I'm also a big fan of Charlotte, um, excuse me, Chattanooga, uh, because they've got the whole fiber thing going on. And there was a great story a couple of years back about how that's sort of fueling a little mini Silicon Valley high tech Uh, surge in downtown. And I think that represents a great opportunity for folks to potentially take advantage of that in that city, which I think makes it a good investment. Uh, But that covers the top five. Uh, $87,500 is an amazing number uh, in terms of low barriers to entry. But let's talk a little bit first about what should draw your attention in these communities. As I've always told folks who want to get into vacation rentals, you have to identify the number one reason why someone would want to rent there. Is it skiing? Is it the ocean? Is it biking trails? Is it hunting? Or is it uh, 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 because of a lake that's nearby and folks want to do that kind of stuff? What is it that makes that a desirable location for a vacation rental? And you need to try to find a property that really has an appeal to that broadest thing that folks are drawn there for. Um, In my case, when I wanted to do the Hawaii thing, at the very least, I needed to have a great view of the ocean. Preferably, I wanted to be right on the beach. I ended up being able to score both of those things with my particular rental. It's right on the beach. You look out the window and you've got a a greater than 180 degree view of the water where it also gets to see the, the, uh, the, the mountains. So it had something the other units in that area don't tend to have. You, if you can get something like that, it'll differentiate you. You are you can take two tactics. You can either increase your rent more and perhaps not get rented as often, but be getting that larger amount. Or you can go for a slightly lower amount where you might be the same price as a lot of other units, but you're offering this better thing and you'll simply rent before those others do. And that's been my tactic. I've, I've rented, literally, I follow the other folks who are renting in my building. I'm sure they hate me for this, but I tend to rent my unit for $1 less than a comparable unit um, simply because I want my unit to rent more. And it does. It, it rents nearly all the time. So understand the tactics, understand the areas, and be drawn. Go ahead and use the techniques we've talked about, particularly for those of you who are in the Rebel Underground, who've joined me in the Rebel Underground by texting the word Rebel Broker to the number 44222. That's text the word Rebel Broker to the number 44222 to join the Rebel Underground. You can check out that video on how to start at the city level and drill down to specific areas that you're going to want to look at for a potential investment. Uh, And just apply what we've just talked about in terms of understanding what's going to be the best decision for you. All right, folks. Man, I hope we covered some good stuff for you or maybe even had you thinking about something different. Um, I, I know a lot of folks don't are a little bit intimidated about vacation rentals simply because my advice is usually to be more involved. If you want more of a hands-off approach to properties, maybe vacation rentals aren't the way for you to go. I just see too many downsides to potentially having a property manager who is likely to be in competition with you or have properties that they're going to rent before yours when they're left in complete control of that stuff. Um, So consider all those options. I hope this uh, has given you something good to think about and what new direction you might take your investments. Thanks for listening, everybody. And I'll talk to y'all next time.